The greenhouse effect is one of the most important factors at play in warming not just the Earth, but any celestial body with an atmosphere. Other than, well, you know, the star, it makes up the most significant source of warmth for a planet. We always spend a lot of attention talking about how the effect works here on Earth, yet not quite enough about how it works on other bodies. Which I think is a real shame, not just because those are interesting, but also because there's a lot more to the effect than CO2 pad, which is the main takeaway you get here on Earth. So I'm gonna do a video about it, going over what the greenhouse effect does and how it affects different bodies in the solar system. Let's dive in. Okay, basics first. While I expect most of you will be roughly familiar with what the greenhouse effect does, let me quickly recap scientifically so we're all on board. Planets tend to be heated primarily by their star, and the amount of heating a planet receives from its star can be precisely calculated using the star's luminosity, the planet's reflectivity, and its distance in orbit by this formula. This returns a value we call the effective temperature, or black body temperature in astronomy. The effective temperature of a body is what results directly from the star, and only from the star. It does not consider any atmosphere, and thus leaves out the greenhouse effect entirely. This is still useful though, because while the greenhouse effect is difficult to calculate directly, it is made easier by just subtracting the effective temperature from the actual temperature to find the greenhouse warming. Now, this does make some assumptions, mainly that all extra temperature will come from the greenhouse effect, which is not true. But apart from some edge cases, such as the planet being heated by radioactive decay and or tidal heating, on Earth 99.97% of its temperature comes from the sun and greenhouse effect combined. So usually, the vast, vast majority of this number will correspond to the actual greenhouse warming. While the influence of the sun's luminosity and the planet's distance to the sun are both obvious factors, worth of a short reflection here is the albedo. In astronomy, the bolometric albedo is simply the percentage of light that gets reflected back into space by the planet's surface. Depending on the body in question, this percentage can vary immensely based on the composition of the surface. Of course, cloud coverage also plays a major role in the planet's albedo, but for the sake of simplicity let's focus on the surface here. Fresh snow on Earth has one of the highest natural albedos, reflecting back about 80% of the incoming sun's energy. Desert sand reflects back about 40%, absorbing the other 60 as heat. And then going further, grasslands absorb over 75% as heat, and forest-covered landscapes only reflect 15% back depending on the type of forest. One of the surface features with the lowest albedo on Earth, at least, is actually the open ocean, which manages to absorb 94% of the sun's energy only reflecting back 6%. For the Earth, all these surface features combine to get an average albedo of 29.5% for the entire planet, meaning we absorb the other 70.5% as heat. This number, however, is not constant. As snow melts in summer and grasslands desertify, the albedo is slowly decreasing, causing more heat to get absorbed. Over the past 25 years, it's estimated the Earth's albedo has decreased with about 0.7%. Alright, so that's all about the effective temperature and albedo. When calculating the effective temperature of the Earth, we find the Earth should actually be 17 degrees below zero. This is obviously not the real situation here, so that then finally brings us to the missing element in the equation and the topic of this video, the greenhouse effect. Which on Earth adds an extra 33 degrees, bringing this number to the more familiar 15 degrees Celsius we live in. How it works is that certain gases like carbon dioxide and water vapor are transparent to the visible light incoming from the sun, but opaque to the longer wavelengths of thermal radiation. So the sunlight passes through these gases in the atmosphere unimpeded, but then the fraction that gets reflected back by the planet's albedo as thermal energy is recaptured. To be blunt, the greenhouse effect patches the heat loss from the planet. 
not just indirectly from the sun, but also from other factors. So rather than heating the planet directly, the greenhouse effect insulates heat loss, heating us indirectly. Together with the effective temperature, this then gives us the value for the body's actual surface temperature, which is usually accurate save some very rare edge cases of the planet being heated by other sources. The greenhouse effect though is not limited to just batching heat loss from the planet's albedo. Even though that's definitely the majority source, the planet's internal heating, tidal heating and ethnogenic warming can all be insulated by the greenhouse effect. On Earth, the primary greenhouse gases are water vapor and carbon dioxide. But let's take a closer look at what the greenhouse effect actually does on other bodies in the solar system. At first glance, Pluto having any greenhouse effect at all might sound ridiculous. After all, as we discussed, it primarily comes from gases in the atmosphere, something Pluto is not exactly known to have many of. After all, it can only muster a pressure of less than 100,000th that of the Earth at the surface. But don't be deceived by that, because despite this fact, Pluto is able to generate a larger greenhouse effect than the Earth has. Yep, you heard me right. The greenhouse effect on Pluto is actually stronger than that of the Earth, totaling out at around 40 degrees. But that's a little bit deceptive though, so let's see how it actually works. Much more important than the pressure is the actual composition of the atmosphere. Pluto's atmosphere is about 99.7% nitrogen, but about a quarter of a percent of it is methane. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas, about 20 times stronger than carbon dioxide. On Earth, the atmosphere only has about 1.7 parts per million of methane, but on Pluto, it has 2,500 parts per million. The methane in Pluto's atmosphere is especially unique, because it concentrates itself at higher altitudes. The result of this being that the surface remains quite cold on average, between about 40 to 60 degrees Kelvin, but about 30 kilometers up in the lower atmosphere, the methane creates a warm coating that raises the temperature to about 110 degrees Kelvin, which is up to 60 degrees warmer than the surface. The reason the surface doesn't warm as much is that the methane sublimes there. Thus, its greenhouse effect becomes much smaller. Pluto also has a thin haze layer of particles in its atmosphere, extending no less than 1000 kilometers above its surface. These haze particles block sunlight and together act as a cooling layer, much stronger than the methane greenhouse effect. So even though Pluto has a strong greenhouse effect, the surface remains among the coldest places in the solar system despite it. Over on the Saturnian moon Titan, it's a very different story. Titan has a thick atmosphere, and its pressure on the surface is almost one and a half times that of the Earth's atmosphere. And unlike Pluto, over 5% of it is methane. So with all this considered, Titan should be a warm greenhouse moon. But in reality, well, mm, no. While the moon's effective temperature is around 191 degrees below zero, the greenhouse effect warms Titan only about 12 degrees, less than half as strong as the Earth. You see, Titan, similar to Pluto, has a haze layer in its higher atmosphere. While the exact composition of Pluto's haze layers is not fully known, Titan's haze layer is composed mainly of organic aerosols such as methane. Combined with its greater density, this blocks almost 90% of the solar light from interacting with the greenhouse effect in the first place, creating something that has been called the anti-greenhouse effect. While well, the expected greenhouse heating on Titan would be about 21 degrees, due to the anti-greenhouse effect created by these haze layers, its actual warming is only 12 degrees at the surface. The interesting thing is that Titan's haze layer is actually largely produced by the condensing of methane at higher altitudes. This happens at a height of about 60 to 80 kilometers above the moon's surface, largely reducing the amount of light that makes it further down. What this means is that the high methane concentrations in Titan's atmosphere actually inhibit their own greenhouse capacity. So while methane is a powerful greenhouse gas in low concentrations, at exceedingly high concentrations, it starts to inhibit its own capacity through the anti-greenhouse effect. Meanwhile, over on Mars, we find a thin atmosphere, which is 95% carbon dioxide. 
Carbon dioxide, or CO2, is a greenhouse gas, but its high concentrations on Mars are counterbalanced by two things. Firstly, Mars's thin atmosphere, meaning that even though it's very concentrated, there still actually isn't that much of it. But then there's also the absence of complementary greenhouse gases, such as water vapor, methane, and ozone, all of which are essential in making carbon dioxide work as a greenhouse gas. The greenhouse effect on Mars is thus primarily created by carbon dioxide, which is a lot less potent than the methane-based greenhouse effects we saw on Pluto and Titan. Combined with its much thinner atmosphere, it makes for a relatively weak overall heating effect. It's worth noting though, that Mars may have had a stronger greenhouse effect in its past, potentially allowing for warmer and wetter conditions. However, the loss of its atmosphere over time has led to the current state of a weak greenhouse effect and the inhospitable surface conditions. Now, I saved the most crazy one for last. Venus has an atmospheric composition similar to that of Mars, having 96% carbon dioxide and 4% other gases, primarily nitrogen. But unlike Mars, the Venusian atmosphere is terribly dense, at the surface reaching pressures over 92 times those found on Earth, meaning that compared to Mars, it's over 10,000 times as dense. This, of course, massively boosts the greenhouse effect on Venus. While its effective temperature would be around 47 degrees below zero, its actual temperature is 465 degrees above zero, making the greenhouse effect there well over 500 degrees strong. What we see on Venus is something called a runaway greenhouse effect. I have a full video about the runaway greenhouse effect on Venus, which I'll put on an info card for you if you want a more detailed explanation, but the bottom line is this. It's suspected that Venus in the distant past was a lot more Earth-like, possibly even having large liquid water oceans. However, due to the sun's increasing luminosity, its surface temperature gradually rose to a tipping point where the oceans heated enough to start mass evaporating. Water vapor is a potent greenhouse gas, so this created a positive feedback loop where the more water evaporated, the quicker the temperature rose, which means even more water would evaporate, you get the picture. As the oceans literally boiled away, the carbon dioxide dissolved in them also got released into the atmosphere, warming the planet even further. This water would then later be stripped from the higher atmosphere due to the intense solar flux, leaving Venus with the hot CO2 atmosphere it has today. Venus has the strongest greenhouse effect known, and it's not even close. When a planet has large amounts of surface water, this makes the balance of the carbon silicate cycle surprisingly fragile. Earth in the distant future could face a similar runaway greenhouse effect as the sun continues to increase in its brightness. What I went over today were just some examples of course, but what I hope I was able to demonstrate from these four is the differences between methane and carbon dioxide based greenhouse effects, as well as the role of pressure. Pluto and Titan are too cold for atmospheric CO2, which freezes solid below minus 56 degrees. Hence, they mainly rely on methane in their greenhouse effects. While both Pluto and Titan have haze layers, they interact very differently with the methane. The greenhouse effect on Pluto warming the upper atmosphere and cooling its surface. On Titan, this effect is even strong enough to manifest an anti-greenhouse effect. Due to this, both bodies exhibit similar degrees of total heating despite the immense differences in pressure. On Mars and Venus, the planets are both warm enough to have atmospheric CO2, but the differences in atmospheric density, as well as their distance to the Sun, create a crazy difference in the power of the greenhouse effects. While Mars has just under 6 degrees of greenhouse heating, on Venus that's well over 500, creating vastly different environments. In conclusion, the greenhouse effect can be a lot more complex in functionality than it appears from just studying it on the Earth. As I mentioned it, I had previously done a video about the greenhouse effect on Venus and I had been wanting to revisit the topic for some time to contrast the effect, not just with the Earth, but against other bodies in the solar system. Today I went over just a few of course, but there is plenty more which I encourage you to look into if you found this an interesting video. If you did, you might want to stick around and subscribe for more. Leave me a comment if you know of any other interesting greenhouse effects in the solar system or beyond. I'd love to read them. This has been Yiji Online, and as always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Stay tuned.